What's up guys? Before I get started, I want to give a shout out to this video's sponsor. This video is sponsored by Honkai Star Rail. Honkai Star Rail is a brand new Hoyoverse space fantasy RPG. A should be familiar name to any fan of the critically acclaimed Genshin Impact. And just like Genshin Impact, Star Rail is free to play. On top of this game having some exciting and strategic RPG gameplay that provides a lot of customization and variety with all of its different locations to explore and characters to meet, it also features an intriguing story with some rich lore and some top-notch artwork, graphics, and music that Hoyoverse's games are famous for. And it can be played anywhere on your Android, iPhone, or Windows PC, with your data being carried over regardless of your chosen platform. Plus. You can also invite your friends to play with you from any of their devices as well. Right now, Honkai is currently in its closed beta period, but it will be releasing very soon. And you can check it out right now using the link down below in the description and pinned comment. Whether you're looking for a game that you could just hop on and off of every now and then while on the go, or something that you can sink dozens of hours into, there is no better choice than Honkai Star Rail. Anyone who has any basic understanding of economics should know how supply and demand works, and this very much applies to the second-hand market of video games. Games that you can easily find for cheap are generally ones that were mass-produced and nobody wants anymore, like outdated sports titles, while games that are expensive are ones that everyone has heard about, but didn't sell well and or weren't kept in print for very long for one or more of many possible reasons. It could be that it wasn't marketed very well, it's part of a long-running series that didn't take off in popularity until recently, or maybe it got negative reviews from critics that didn't bother to actually learn how to play the game and probably shouldn't have reviewed it to begin with. I won't be naming anything specific, but a certain imaginative gaming network and their review of a certain Hand of God comes to mind. There are a lot of examples I could talk about, but I reckon nobody else has published more games that fall into this category than Atlas. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, Atlas West, known back then as Atlas USA, actually used to be a publisher of third-party games that they didn't make, However, they didn't stay in print for very long. Even back then, they were infamous for their games having extremely short print runs, and you could probably already figure out the effects this had in the long run. And they actually did address this in an interview with MTV way back in 2008, and provided a pretty valid reason that makes a lot of sense from a business standpoint. Basically, they acknowledged that most of their games were expected to appeal to a very niche audience, and the short printing was done as a safety measure, with it being better to come up short in sales than having excess products lying around that will probably spend most of their lives in the bargain bins at Toys R Us. And this wasn't something that just applied to their third-party published games. Nocturne, Digital Devil Saga, Rido, even Persona 3 and 4 weren't exactly smash hits when they released. If you look far back enough, you could probably even find them on a few underrated PS2 games list, even though since then these games have been reprinted to death, but that's more than can be said of their other games. Nowadays we're living in a time where Persona, Fire Emblem, Yakuza, even freaking Atelier are doing well enough to be considered a success, something I don't think anyone would have ever believed 15 years ago. While I completely understand Atlas's policy with its short print runs, and it might even be one of the reasons they're still around today, it does still kind of suck how rare some of these games are, and because I'm sure Atlas has since lost the publishing rights to most of these games, they're probably never getting reprinted, and it's only going to keep getting worse. In this video, I'm going to be looking at the rarest and most expensive games Atlas has ever published, and just to be clear, I'm not going to be including any Mega 10 games on here, because I'd much rather cover those games in other videos. But now that that's out of the way, let's get on with the video. And we'll start with a game that is somewhat well known, mainly because it's been a cult classic for a while. This game is Steambot Chronicles, developed by Irem and released for the PS2 in 2005 in Japan and 2006 in North America. Steambot Chronicles is a game that I hear described a lot as an action RPG, but it's really more part action RPG, part open world, part rhythm game, and part life simulation game. Yeah. This game is set in an early 20th century Europe inspired steampunk world. You take on the role of Vanilla, a guy who is woken up on the beach by a musician named Connie, and get this, he's lost his memories. He and Connie become friends as he helps her gather together her band so that they can perform a concert downtown. After this, she and her band leave for the next town, and from here, the story can go in just about any direction you want it, and that's one of the great things about this game, the choices. 
In addition to an abundance of side quests and nearly every conversation having multiple dialogue options that allow you to either be nice or a complete butthole, the story is dynamic and you can influence it into one of several possible directions that affect how the plot progresses and which ending you get. Even how Vanilla uncovers his backstory is affected by your choices, which is not only cool, but it adds replayability to an already content-rich game. Now, the story itself isn't anything too mind-blowing, and in fact it actually takes a sort of laid-back approach, but in a good way. What I mean by this is that it's not shoved in your face, but it's told in a way that's very relatable and immersive. For a good chunk of the game, there isn't really much of a plot at all. Like, there are characters, there's conflict, and there are things to do, but there's not much of a driving force behind it all other than the characters just going about their daily lives. For example, in the early parts of the game, as you're helping Connie, you'll learn more about her backstory, like her caring for her bedridden mother, and that she's part of a band called the Garland Globetrotters. Eventually, you'll get a chance to join them, and you'll be able to perform with them in concerts and help them out and grow attached to them as you learn about their backstories and their reasons for performing too. It really makes you feel like you're a part of the game's world, and this is also because of the amount of freedom the game gives you. There is a lot of stuff to do in this game. Not just side quests, but you can customize your clothing, your haircut, your mech, which I'll get more into in a minute. The cities are very detailed, and almost every building in them is explorable. You can buy a house, buy furniture, you can play instruments, earn money by playing instruments, buy and trade stocks, even date the female characters. Not to mention, this game has two modes that support two players. Battle mode, where two mechs fight against each other in an arena, and billiards, which is... Well, billiards. And it's a surprisingly well done minigame, all things considered. But I haven't even gotten into this game's main focus, that being the mechs, which are called Trotmobiles, which you use to get around and fight enemies. Provided you have the right parts, you can transform your Trotmobile into almost anything you want, and it's important to consistently maintain your mech and keep upgrading it so that you'll be able to keep fighting enemies as the game goes on. Now, the Trotmobiles control in a very unconventional way. By pressing forward on the left stick, your vehicle will move forward, but will also turn slightly right, while doing this with the right stick will turn you slightly left. It sounds like a nightmare in theory, but it's actually pretty easy to get the hang of, and it actually adds another layer of immersion to this game given the primitive nature of these designs. All your other standard actions like attacking, dodging, and jumping are all done with the shoulder buttons, and you can lock onto enemies with square. Although, I will say that the combat isn't one of this game's strong points. I mean, it's not terrible, but it boils down to little more than locking on, dodging, and spamming your attacks, with the most amount of variation being the ability to pick up and throw objects or use them as weapons. But this leads into what is probably this game's biggest flaw, the flimsiness of your mechs. In addition to your mech's health bar, you also have to worry about its fuel meter. If it runs out of fuel, you have to slowly limp around until you get to a repair station and your melee weapons have a durability meter that goes down pretty quickly, and ammo for projectile weapons is extremely limited. You can still attack once your weapon breaks or runs out of ammo, but all you get is this dinky little arm swing that barely does any damage. When you're in the open areas going from one town to another, you'll have to fight because hostile enemies are all over the place, but you'll usually have enough resources to take on a handful of enemies. You can ignore them, but you may need to fight them if you're running low on fuel since that's something they drop when you kill them. Either way, it's annoying, and it means that you can't really spend a lot of time exploring these open fields. And pretty much every time you get to a town, the first thing you have to do is head straight to the repair shop to fix your machine, which gets annoying after a while. I will say though, the presentation for this game is magnificent. It's another one of those games that uses a cel-shaded art style, and even after all these years, it still looks good. And like I said before, the environments are very detailed and really help bring this game's world to life. That's also true for not only the background music, but also the music that you and the band play. Although the voice acting is kind of hit or miss, some of the characters have good voice actors like Wendy Lee who voices Connie, and Vanilla who's voiced by Spike Spencer, but most of the voice acting for the side characters is just okay. Overall though, Steambot Chronicles is a really awesome game that you can easily get hooked on and sink dozens if not hundreds of hours into. It's definitely a one-of-a-kind experience that you can't get anywhere else, and might just be the only game in this video that is actually worth the price. Generally, I see this game going for anywhere between $120 to $200, with the former being for a loose copy, and the latter being an inbox copy that may or may not have the manual with it. If you aren't too sure though, I suppose you could buy the demo disc for around $25. 
Also, apparently there was a sequel planned for this game, but it was cancelled in 2011. Although there were two spin-offs, Battle Tournament for the PSP, and a board-style game called Blockus Portable Steambot Championship, which I don't even think I should count. Maybe one day we'll see a digital re-release, or even better, a spiritual successor, since we've been getting that a lot recently, but until then, all we can do is keep our hopes up. Alright, for this next one, we have a double entry, because both of these games are part of the same franchise. Dokapon Kingdom for the Wii and PS2, and Dokapon Journey for the DS. Now, Dokapon Kingdom is a game some of you may have heard of. Both of these games are part of a series that is pretty long-running in Japan, but these two are the only ones that got an official English release. Dokapon Kingdom is, well, a party game that takes place on a board. You're probably already thinking that it's a Mario Party clone, but that's actually not true at all. It's more of a party game and RPG hybrid, something that, before playing, I didn't even think could exist. Almost every game mode in Dokapon Kingdom is playable with four players. In fact, while you can play with AI-controlled enemies, playing through the story with multiple players is not only possible, but it's actually encouraged. The story for Dokapon Kingdom is that the kingdom is being invaded by monsters, and then two to four players have to compete against each other to save the kingdom even though the main motivation for the player is to actually earn the most money, because whoever has the most money will be able to marry either the princess or the king, depending on the player's gender. And you're encouraged to make that possible through whatever means necessary, even if they're less than ethical. Yeah, Dokapon Kingdom is very much a game that will probably ruin friendships when you play. I mean, that's what's advertised on the back of the box. In Dokapon Kingdom, you can actually create your own character and customize his or her stats and choose one of three classes. Warrior, Thief, or Magician. You can also level up and change classes later on if you want. Another thing, when you spin the wheel to move forward, you're allowed to move in any direction you want. You're not just limited to moving forward, in fact the board actually has a much more non-linear structure than Mario Party, and most players will probably scatter in different directions early on. Now, throughout the board you can accept missions, buy new equipment, fight enemies or bosses, explore dungeons, sometimes you can even do things like rob stores or send hitmen after the other players. When you land on a blank space, sometimes you'll get an event where an NPC will give you some kind of test or special item, but usually you'll have to fight an enemy, and that leads to what is probably one of this game's biggest flaws, the combat. Whenever you go into combat, you and the opponent pick a card to see who goes first, then you both choose an action, and then you do this again. In most cases, the battles will be over within one turn, but if both combatants are still standing at the end, the next turn will pick up where the battle left off, and you won't be able to do anything else that turn. It can be frustrating, especially when you get into a battle against an enemy that is much higher level than you and or you lose due to RNG, which leads into what is probably this game's second biggest overall flaw, the reliance on luck. Don't get me wrong, there is a lot of strategy involved with Dokapon Kingdom, but no matter how well you're playing, a single mishap could easily make you lose a lot of progress and potentially cost you the game. Personally, when playing this game, I have horrible luck. Just watch this footage of me playing with my friends. Strike. Whatever. This is your <laughs> Let's go! <F> you! <laughs> your mom. Dude, <laughs> this game is so, Charlie, so much harder than SMT. This bro. game is so can't much harder than it. SMT. Oh, I hate this. But then again, that randomness and unpredictability is part of what makes these types of games so much fun, especially when played with other people. Although, I should point out that games of Dokapon Kingdom can go on for quite a while, and it's extremely unlikely that you'll be able to do a full game in one sitting. It's really something that you and your friends have to dedicate yourselves to when playing, but if you can find a group of friends willing to play with you, you're in for quite a fun time. Now, Dokapon Journey, you may think would be a completely different game, seeing as how it is on the DS and came out about a year later, but it's actually very similar. The story is pretty much the same idea, finish with the most money, marry the princess, yada yada. Obviously, the graphics aren't as good with the DS being a handheld and the graphics are now all in 2D, but honestly, the Dokapon series has a very cartoonish, chibi art style, and I actually think it looks much better in 2D than it did in 3D. Especially when you remember that Dokapon is in large part a parody of classic RPGs from the old days of gaming. The gameplay is almost identical. You still navigate the board the same way, combat is pretty much the same, and I am about equally as bad at this game as I am at Dokapon Kingdom. Although, you do have more classes to choose from at the start of the game. 
One thing that's cool is that it is possible to play the game in multiplayer mode through either DS download play or hot seat mode, which is where you pass the DS around between multiple people. I mean, the console version had this too, but it's not something you see with a lot of handheld games. Both of these games are pretty good, but I wouldn't say they're worth the asking prices. I should mention though, this game is getting a remake which is supposed to come out sometime soon. If you're absolutely dying to play this game, just wait for that. It'll be better to pay $60 for a brand new game than the upwards of $120 that either of these games will cost you. Up next is another double entry, and these two games are the only Atlas published games for GameCube. They are Go Go Hyper Grind and Cubivore Survival of the Fittest. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about these games though because I already covered them in previous videos. To start things off, Cubivore is a game originally developed by Intelligent Systems, planned originally for the Nintendo 64 disk drive, but was later moved to the GameCube due to the failure of that platform. If, like me, you played Melee back in the day, the first time you probably ever saw or heard of anything related to this game was with the trophy simply titled Alpha. Although that animal doesn't actually appear anywhere in Cubivore, but the pig from the game appears as a spirit in Smash Ultimate. Like I said, this game was developed by Intelligent Systems and published by Nintendo in Japan, but published by Atlas in North America. I imagine the reason it wasn't brought over by Nintendo was because it wasn't really up to the quality standards that Nintendo wanted from GameCube games, but it has a certain charm to it. There's also the way the game is based on the process of evolution and natural selection. This game has you take on the role of a pig who is determined to defeat the killer Cubivore, but in order to do this he has to mutate by not only eating other Cubivores, but also by mating, a process that actually kills him, so you're technically playing as a new animal each time you do this. While there are a lot of different factors that contribute to how well your character can move, fight, survive, and stuff like that, the gameplay pretty much just boils down to wandering around and pouncing on enemies until they die. It's not exactly a very complicated game, and it's nothing revolutionary, even at the time it came out, but like I said, the art style, the atmosphere, the music, and the game's somewhat dark humor really make it a unique experience. The other Atlas GameCube game, Go Go Hypergrind, was actually developed in-house by Team Paponchi, a developer under Atlas, who worked with some of the creators of Ren and Stimpy to develop this game, and despite it being made by a Japanese studio, it was only ever released in North America. Go Go Hypergrind is a skateboarding game where you compete against other cartoon characters in a competition to be the star of Spoonco's next big cartoon. It plays like most of the other skateboarding games from the early to mid 2000s. You try to perform tricks to get points, but you can also do special tricks called negative reactions, where, with good enough timing of a button, you'll get beat up and still be able to keep skateboarding and will get a ton of points, and you can continue doing this to get ridiculous amounts of them. It's a pretty fun time, until you factor in the price that you'll have to pay for a physical copy, and that goes for Cubivore 2. The lowest price I've seen GoGo -Go Hyper Grind for in recent times is around $200, while well, Cubivore generally goes for around $500 at the minimum. Out of both of these games, I can maybe see Cubivore getting a re-release, seeing as how Nintendo published the game in Japan, but GoGo -Go Hyper Grind would be a licensing nightmare, and I doubt something Atlas would be willing to go through the effort of re-releasing, even if it was something fans asked for. Okay, it's no secret that Atlas is responsible for developing some crappy movie licensed NES games in their early years. Yeah, some of those games that were made infamous by the angry video game nerd like The Karate Kid and Friday the 13th were actually developed by Atlas, but most people wouldn't know that because these games are normally associated more with LJN. However, there is one game that gets overlooked a lot, Wacky Races for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Now, if you're not familiar with Wacky Races, it's one of many Saturday morning cartoons by Hanna-Barbera that aired in the late 60s, but was successful enough to continue getting broadcast decades later. I myself have a lot of memories watching this show on Boomerang when I went to visit my grandparents as a kid. Each episode follows a bunch of different racers with different themes racing against each other using whatever advantages they can to finish first. And in the midst of it all is Dick Dastardly, who usually tries to sabotage the other racers in the worst possible ways but they almost always backfire and he never wins. So, how do you take a concept like that and turn it into a game? Well, you would think the obvious answer would be to make it into a racing game with vehicular combat elements like Mario Kart, but I guess someone at Atlas thought there weren't enough side-scrollers on the NES. I mean, I'm pretty sure the real reason is due to console limitations, and side-scrollers were already a well-established genre on that system that Atlas themselves had experience with 
so that's why they decided to go with it. Wacky Races has you take on the role of Muttley doing whatever task Dastardly needs you for, which depend on the level you're playing. The game is divided into three subsections, each of which contain three levels, except for the last one which has four, and you can play any of these subsections in any order you want, although regardless of which one you're playing, each level has the same goal, make it to the end. The gameplay pretty much speaks for itself. If you played any of the popular side-scrolling platformers on the NES like Super Mario Bros, Kirby's Adventure, Mega Man, etc., you could pretty easily get an idea of what this game is about. You jump across platforms, avoid hazards, collect power-ups, fight enemies, you know, standard stuff. For a licensed NES title, it's a surprisingly well-made game. Muttley controls really well, and the level design is good, and the combat is decent, although some of the bosses can be frustrating at times. By default, Muttley attacks with this simple bite, but by collecting bones he can unlock new attacks, like a throwable bomb, a bark that acts as a projectile, and the ability to glide by wagging his tail. Visually, it looks pretty good too, for the 8-bit NES anyway. The sprites all look really good, and each of the levels have a distinct visual style that is pretty cool, and the music is awesome. Overall, Wacky Races is a pretty well-made and surprisingly fun platformer for the NES, but it has one glaring flaw. There is no save feature, and no password system. Really? I could maybe understand if this was an early NES game, but this game released in Japan in 1991, the same year as the SNES. At the very least, you can play the three worlds in any order, like I said, but you can't jump between the levels themselves. The game is pretty short, though, and as far as licensed NES games are concerned, this is definitely one of the better choices. A physical copy, from what I've seen, usually goes for around four to five hundred dollars. This was one of the first games Atlas ever published, and I also imagine the fact that it's based on a somewhat popular classic cartoon is part of the reason it's so expensive as well. Also, due to obvious licensing issues, this is probably another game we'll never see get a re-release of any kind. It's definitely not worth the price tag, but maybe worth checking out through other means if you're a fan of wacky races. Also, the Japanese version actually isn't all that expensive in comparison, and seeing as how this isn't a very text-heavy game, you're not really missing out on much by going with that version if you can't speak Japanese. Okay, so not only are these next two games the oldest ones on here, but they're also two of some you may be familiar with without even knowing it. The first game is Spud's Adventure for the Game Boy, and the second is Amazing Tater, also for the Game Boy. And if the latter name doesn't sound familiar, you might recognize it by its Japanese name, Puzzle Boy 2. That's right, Puzzle Boy was the first game ever to be both developed and published by Atlas in 1989, but in North America, it would be released under the name Quirk by Acclaim Entertainment. That was because Atlas's American subsidiary, Atlas USA, didn't exist at the time, and in fact Spud's Adventure and Amazing Tater were the second and third games that Atlas USA ever published. I'll start by talking about Spud's Adventure since it came first. Spud's Adventure is a spin-off of the Puzzle Boy series. It's a dungeon crawler with light RPG elements, and believe it or not, it actually has a story. It's set in a place called Vegetable Kingdom, and one day, the king decides that it's time for his daughter to get married, and right after they have this conversation, she gets kidnapped. So the king sends out two of his best knights, Arnie Eggplant and Garrett Carrot, to go rescue her. After they fail to come back, he decides to send a lone wandering potato named Spud. There's not much more to it than that. It's pretty much your run-of-the-mill rescue the princess kind of story, but as far as Game Boy games go, this is actually a pretty story-heavy game. It even has NPCs that you'll run into that you can talk to while exploring. Now, as far as gameplay is concerned, it's actually very similar to Jack Bros. You walk around different floors of different dungeons, and every floor has one goal, to find the exit, and you keep doing this until you fight the boss at the end of the area. Sometimes you'll get to branching pathways, and sometimes floors will have gimmicks or handicaps thrown in to spice up the gameplay. For example, one floor may have inverted controls, one may have your attacks disabled, one may have the lights flickering on and off, one may have an invisible warp point, one may require you to navigate invisible blocks, stuff like that. Sometimes you'll also get to these rooms that require you to solve block puzzles nodding back to the series this game is based on, which I'll get to in just a minute. I also did mention earlier that this game has RPG elements, but all this boils down to is that every time you kill an enemy, you get some experience, and once you get 100, you level up, and your health bar increases. Although you can find power-ups that give you a quote-unquote stronger attack, where instead of whatever attack you'd normally use, you just kind of launch a copy of yourself forward, 
which doesn't even do as much damage as most of your attacks and is the same for every character and wears off after you take a hit anyway. And yes, you also have different characters you could play as and there are some slight variations between them. Graphically, there's not a lot to say. I mean, it looks fine considering the limitations of the Game Boy. In fact, the cinematic cutscenes actually look pretty good. But one thing that is kind of annoying is that you'll hear the same music almost through the entirety of the game. All things considered, it's a pretty simple game overall and can easily be beaten in one sitting. Although, this game doesn't have a save feature. You instead use passwords to skip parts of the game you've already beaten, except no matter where you skip to with these passwords, you always start back at level 1. If you're playing this game on an emulator, I wouldn't feel bad about using save states. Overall, Spud's Adventure is an okay game. I don't know if I would recommend you play through it unless you have to experience one of Atlas's first games, and it's definitely not worth the price it's currently trending at, which is anywhere from $750 for a loose cartridge to $25,000 for a brand new copy. But what about Amazing Tater? Well, like I said, with this one being a direct sequel to the first Puzzle Boy, this game takes the series back to its puzzle roots. In fact, if you've played the puzzle minigame in SMT Nocturne, this style of gameplay should look very familiar because this is what that game is based on. Once again, you take on the role of Spud, who is now just represented by a smiley face, but you have to do things like push blocks into place and move through rotating obstacles to make it to the end of every stage. It sounds simple on paper, but this is actually a rather difficult game. Even the earlier stages on easy mode require a lot of thinking, and one small mistake could lock you out of being able to complete the level, forcing you to restart, although it never actually gets to the point of frustration. For such a simple concept, it's surprisingly addicting and a lot of fun. I imagine back in the day, this game was perfect for killing time during a boring car ride or waiting on your food at a busy restaurant. There are also four different modes, practice mode, beginner mode, puzzle mode, and action mode. These are mostly the same with small variations. For example, beginner mode lets you use hints in case you get stumped, which is nice, and action mode, which actually has a story. It's a good game, and I definitely think it holds up a lot better than its brother, Spud's Adventure, but it's still not worth the grand or so you're gonna have to cough up to get a physical copy, if you can even find one, but it is worth giving a playthrough on an emulator. And, you know, seeing as how all these games were developed by Atlas and I assume they still own the rights to them, it wouldn't hurt to give them some kind of re-release. I mean, I'm sure it would be popular among SMT fans seeing as how the Puzzle Boy minigame in Nocturne is looked back on pretty fondly. I would definitely love to see a more expanded version of that as maybe a digital download or, if that's too much effort, maybe make a digital collection of all the Puzzle Boy games for the Switch eShop or iOS and Android or something like that. I don't know, maybe if we get a hashtag trending or something, but for now, let's move on to our final game. The game that I'm sure most of you immediately thought of when you clicked on this video, Rule of Rose. Not only is Rule of Rose one of the most expensive PS2 games, it's also one of the most controversial. Sony passed on publishing this game in North America due to the content of the game, leaving it to be published by Atlas, and in Europe, more specifically in Britain, a lot of media outlets started jumping to conclusions about the contents of the game, leading to it being banned in the UK, as well as Australia and New Zealand. Now, I'm not sure if this had anything to do with the game not selling well in North America or not, but this game also wasn't received very well by critics. But how good is the game? Well, the opening cinematic, which you've been seeing on screen, is really cool and does a really good job of letting you know what to expect going forward. Rule of Rose is set in 1930s England, where you take on the role of Jennifer, an orphan who is on her way home through this creepy-looking forest on a creepy-looking bus, where some boy asks her to read from a crudely put-together book. For whatever reason, the bus stops in the middle of nowhere, the boy runs off, and she decides to chase the boy into a creepy house. Once she finds him, she finishes the book, then she gets thrown into a coffin and dragged off to God knows where, where she is forced to deliver certain gifts. The majority of this game involves you looking for gifts to give to this aristocrat club to meet their demands. Otherwise, they'll kill you, and you have to do this once a month. Now, I've heard Rule of Rose described as a survival horror game, but it's really more of a puzzle game with survival horror elements. I mean, don't get me wrong, the horror is there, but combat clearly wasn't the focus of this game. Encounters with enemies aren't super common, and honestly, the combat is kind of... not good. I mean, I get it, it's horror, they want you to feel helpless, and you're not playing as a trained agent or soldier like in Resident Evil or something. In fact, most of the time, it's better to just run away than waste your time fighting enemies whenever you can. 
The rest of the gameplay has you walking around the ship trying to find whatever gift is asked of you for that particular month. This is good and all, but Rule of Rose is oftentimes kind of vague with what you're supposed to do, and in order to advance, you have to reach trigger points that trigger very specific events that allow you to get what you need to advance. I will say though, figuring out what to do on your own is very rewarding, but it can also be very frustrating when you're wandering around aimlessly trying to figure out what to do next, especially when you take into consideration your character's slow movement and lack of ability to run, and the amount of times you'll be opening doors that take you to different areas. Each time you open a door, you go into this long animation and then have a black screen that lasts for about a second before loading the next area. It's not too bad on its own, but like I said, you'll be doing this a lot, and with how similar a lot of these areas look, it's extremely easy to get lost. Now, if there is one thing that Rule of Rose excels at, it's the dark and disturbing atmosphere and art style. It doesn't rely on cheap gimmicks like jump scares or trying to just be disgusting, but instead through its somber graphics and music, and putting you into and having you navigate out of these scary situations that really leave you wondering why they're happening. At the start, you're just kind of thrown into the game without a lot of context as to what's going on or why it's happening, but the further in you get, the more you learn about what's going on and what led up to this whole event happening, and honestly, it just leaves you more depressed than scared. I don't want to show too much of this game though because I don't want to spoil anything and Rule of Rose is really the kind of game you want to go into without being spoiled because that would in many ways ruin the experience. Overall, Rule of Rose is one of those games that's carried by its story and presentation. The gameplay isn't the best, but if you could stomach some wonky combat and confusing navigation and puzzle solving, you just may be in for a really good time with Rule of Rose. While I do own this game physically, I did play on an emulator to record footage, and unfortunately when I played there was this weird noisy effect over the screen that I couldn't fix, but honestly I think this kind of adds to the atmosphere of the game. Rule of Rose is one of the rarest games on the PS2, and probably the rarest and most expensive game Atlas has ever published. And I say probably because the price has been all over the place recently. When I started working on this video, the lowest I found it for was around 800 bucks, but more recently I've seen it dip into the $500 range. Either way, I really can't recommend it for that price, although there has been talk of a remaster from indie publisher Onion Games, but they've said that this is very unlikely. But anyway, that is going to be it for this video. I hope you all enjoyed, and be sure to let me know what you think. Do any of you guys own any of these games yourselves? Are there any I happen to miss? Be sure to let me know in the comments. Be sure to check out my other links in the description. Consider leaving me a coffee donation. And until the next video, I will see you all later.